when you think about like the, the, your favorite products or the brands that you love, that you really rep for, the logos that you feel comfortable wearing out in public, the, the products that you share with anyone, you know, friends, family, whatever. The reason why those brands have you in their clutches is because they have done the brand awareness work to get you to that place where you're an evangelist and an advocate, not just a customer. And if you're not letting your head of marketing invest in the non-provable channels to enable that, that's what's preventing you from hitting the next phase of growth. Hi, and welcome to SaaS Half Full, the only show serving B2B SaaS marketers. I am Lindsay Grober, president of Blast Media. And as always, I will be both your host and bartender today. I had an awesome conversation today with Ali Fazal, who is the VP of marketing at Grin. And Ali and I dive into the world of and rise of the creator economy. So think of influencers, think of all the creators that we have now that are out there putting out amazing content but specifically as it relates to the B2B marketing world, which is a little bit new for all of us. And if you think about it, we used to tune into brands, what the brands were putting out, what they were talking about. And now we really tune into people or are influenced by what the people are saying on all different channels and platforms and mediums. We are going to talk through the different channels that you should be looking at, how you should approach influencers in a way to make it authentic to your brand and then more specifically, how to measure the impact of working within the creator economy. So if you care to, grab a drink and join me as I speak with Ali from Grin. Hey, Ali, welcome to SaaS Half Full. Hey, Lindsay, how's it going? It is good. It is so nice to meet you. I am doing a Topo Chico seltzer. I'm in the office today, so I never know what I'm going to get when I open up our beverage fridge. But this one looks refreshing for a pretty hot and humid Indianapolis day today. Well, cheers. Thanks for joining me. Ali, we are going to talk today. Uh, we're going to cover a number of things, but predominantly we're going to talk about the rise of the creator economy and specifically what that means for and as it relates to B2B brands. It's not necessarily a area that B2B is associated with in terms of influencers or creators. Um, so we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I want to give our listeners a bit more insight into who you are as a human being and uh, certainly give us to uh, the elevator pitch on what is Grin. Um, so lead us into your story here, Ali. How did you get into B2B SaaS marketing? Is this a newer journey for you or have you been doing this for quite some time? Yeah. So I guess time is relative, right? So for me, it feels like I'm brand new, but also like I've been doing this for decades and I, the truth is somewhere in between. I actually started my career. I grew up in Texas. I started my career in DC though, working on the Hill. So I did marketing for the Library of Congress. But I don't know if you remember, like maybe 10, 12 years ago, that was around the time that the government kept shutting down. Uh, so I would just get like random calls on a Sunday being like, hey, like don't have a job this week. And we'll Good not times. Be so I was like, man, I really should. I thought a career in you know government and policy would be really stable. Unfortunately, it was not the case. So I sought out the next most stable thing that I could think of, which is tech startups, right? Never known for volatility. So a friend of mine helped me do some research in Silicon Valley, got a job as a BDR actually for a SaaS company in California, and then sort of worked my way through the ranks from there. So I've now worked for six different like high growth SaaS companies, okay. you know, all, all the ones that are like, you know, fun, venture capital, like backed, have a beverage fridge as well. So it's just a space of love. And I think I'm like a startup guy for life now, I think. Absolutely. And wow, what a stable time to be a SaaS company. I mean, you are just really thumb full circle here. Could be the most <laughs> rocky, insane time. Literally, my heart goes out to SaaS founders and SaaS marketers right now. It has been an interesting 12 months to say the least. Just when we thought it couldn't get any crazier, right? Post COVID, here we are. Uh, but I know I know several uh, marketing leaders or CMOs that, that that grew up through the BDR route. And in my opinion, they always make some of the best marketers because they truly do understand both sides of the revenue generating machine. Um, so I'm sure that your colleagues and your sales leaders appreciate that background that you have. Let's hope we can. Uh, there's probably some that do, probably some that don't. But for better or for worse, like I've done every job in like the revenue function. I've done. I've worked directly with customers post-sale. I've worked with customers pre-sale. I've been hung up on by prospects. I appreciate having like the full context nonetheless. Absolutely. 
And so today you are VP of Marketing at Grin. Tell us, what does Grin do? Why do you all exist? Yes. So we are a creator management platform, sort of born out of the big shift that consumers have experienced over the last decade, right? You know, our, our CEO, Brandon, loves to say that we used to tune into companies and now we tune into people. And mm -hmm. I know I found that case, which is sort of like what really resonated with me about the company. Like, I think back to my, uh, my childhood, I'm aging myself as like a white suit kid here, but like I was obsessed with MTV and the VMAs. And it really used to be all about like the networks that we would tune into. And now when I think about where my attention is gone, I'm now into the individual people. So, you know, I may follow Selena Gomez on every social network possible, but I don't necessarily tune into like TV networks or companies in the same way anymore. Sure. And so, you know, through this consumer attention shift that's happened across the industry, it's created the need for a product like Grit. So we're a creator management platform that helps companies essentially connect with and market through humans. So everything from finding creators to work with, formalizing the communication with them and streamlining that process, getting them product, you know, in their hands so that they can actually be true ambassadors of the brand, all the way through to collecting the content on behalf of the brand, paying the creators as well. All of that happens through the brand platform. So, you know, a lot of consumer brands like Gims, Allbirds, Majuri, Warby Parker, you know, the ones that are really well known for working with creators and doing really great at influencer marketing, use Grin to help them power their programs. Uh, I love that. I literally wrote down that we used to tune to companies. Now we tune into peoples and creators. That's probably going to end up in this episode description. So thank you for making my job easier. I love that. Well, let's take a step back and start at the beginning is who do you classify as a creator? Yeah, so this is a this is a hot topic of conversation. And I think like the creator economy has matured so much so quickly that all of these definitions are still definitely flexible. So like if you're listening to this episode two years from now, there's probably like brand new information that we don't even have right now. I think of like TikTok and the way it plays into my life and just consumer behavior now in general. And like I think of two years ago before the pandemic and it was totally different. So right now, I think what's cool about the creator economy is that really anybody can be a creator. And sometimes like I know when I talk to my parents or people who are not as familiar with the space, think of an influencer as someone who you know, maybe has a following for being on a reality show or having some sort of other public profile who's just like posting photos of products to try and make money. And certainly like that type of influencer is a part of the creator economy, but it's everything from, you know, like journalists and PR professionals to podcasters like yourself to athletes, public personalities, all the way to like key opinion leaders in small communities. So, you know, like some of the clients we work with have really successful creator campaigns with people who have followers in the hundreds. So I think everybody from your neighbor whose opinion you really trust because they live in the same place as you and they have a similar lifestyle to you all the way to, you know, the celebrity that you've been following since you were a kid, all of those people classify as creators. Sure. Is it accurate to say that not all creators are influencers, but all influencers are creators? Yeah, for sure. I think that that's yeah. definitely like how you think about it. And the creator economy is sort of like for everyone. Like, as, as kumbaya as that sounds, like there is a place where all different creator types and sizes, all places on different networks. So I think, I think that definitely is fair to say. For sure. When we think of specifically, when we put our brains in more of like the, that influencer category, we, we do automatically go to more of that B2C where it's a, you know, could be a TikTok and it's like this link to buy or, it, you know, it is, it's could be an impulse purchase. And then that you know, brand is really looking at how much product did I sell? Uh, and oftentimes we associate influencers with high following. But when you look at it from a B2B standpoint, you're really looking at something very different. So talk to us about how B2B brands are leveraging the creator economy in a different way. For sure. And I love talking about this because it's a, it's an area that's new just for the industry in general and a, an area that we're focusing a lot here at Grin on. But like it starts all the way from people who are well known in your space, right? So before I even knew what Grin was, the last company I worked at is a company called Hibop. They do sort of people management software. And we worked oh, really closely yeah. with someone named Josh Burson, who's really well known as like a thought leader in sort of like the culture, company culture, work culture space. And so we worked really closely with him because he just believed in our mission and believed in what we were doing. And if you think about it at its basic level, that is influencer marketing, right? If you think about getting testimonials from your customers or getting them to share you know, how your product has helped them with their community. That's influencer marketing. So I think like when you think about B2B, it really is about spreading the word in the same way that you see in the, in the consumer space all the time. But I think as B2 
B2B SaaS has become more democratized, right? There are so many op more options. There's a lot of products on the market that solve similar needs. What really sets vendor apart is social proof from people that are actually trusted. Because I know this for myself too. Of course, my marketing team at Grid is going to put all of the amazing stuff on our website, all of the G2 badges we've received, right? All of the like accolades that we've gotten that of course mean a lot. But really, who you're going to believe if you're if you're thinking of buying influencer marketing software is someone who has used Grin, who's trying to accomplish something similar to you and is in your community and has credibility. And really, that's like credibilities and authenticity is at the root of influencer marketing, regardless of B2B. No, absolutely. Um, and side note, we just had Sarah Reynolds, who is the now CMO of Highbog. Her episode dropped today. Um, she was my oh, cool. my last guest. Yeah, she was my not last guest. She was awesome. So talk to us a little bit about then how should B2B brands go about choosing the influencers or creators, if they're not quite influencers yet, that are best for that brand. And that could be one where it is the most authentic to their brand. It makes sense. The ones that hopefully will bring the most value. How does that process start of identifying and weeding those out? Yeah. So it's different for every company, but I think you can look at it in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, most SaaS products have a mission or a way in which they're trying to change the landscape that they are impacting. So if you're a product that wants to make life easier for engineers or you're a product that wants to, you know, like streamline admin for finance professionals, whatever the, the mission is that you're trying to change the world with, that's a great place to start. Finding people who are like-minded and believe in that mission, those are often a great creator profile for you to target as a B2B company. And then you can sort of move further down the funnel there. Like, let's say, you know, you're priced in a space where maybe you're the premium offering amongst your competition. Where you really want to target there is people who have understood and can acknowledge the ROI of your product, right? To show that being the premium offering is like, it's worth the extra expense or the extra money. So target people who are well-regarded in their communities as being really discerning when it comes to value or being really mindful when it comes to where to spend or really efficient in the way that they, you know, spend on on tools and, and software and technology. So I think like you can start at sort of the the top of people who believe in your mission and sort of work down strategically based on what part of your funnel you're trying to impact. And I think that's really where you can use it within. Are there suggestions that you have on finding a match that's authentic to the brand? Because I would imagine for for B2B brands who are going into this for the first time and, and looking at leveraging the creator economy is you would first go to followers, right? Who has the most social proof and social influence, but that could potentially not work. I mean, we're pretty savvy as consumers, right? And consumers of content where we're like, this, this doesn't match. What are, do you, what are some advice that you have on finding that authentic match for the brand? Or I guess if you think about the times where it's gone wrong, what does that look like? But maybe like the importance of it being an authentic connection. Yeah, I think what's crazy about it is like, it's the same advice that I would give to someone who was doing this B2C, which is that don't look at follower count. Don't look at the profile of the person in terms of their reach. Really focus on like the actual shared connection and authenticity that exists between your company and the individual. And so I, in the same way that we've seen you know, huge debacles in influencer marketing, think of like the, the Pepsi incident a few years ago, right? Like it all stems from not really having that shared connection over what is trying to be sold. I'm like a big believer that in both B2C and B2B, consumers don't mind being advertised to. That's how we discover new right. products. We how we it. like, yeah, we, we not only expect it, we embrace it, right? That's the same reason why like half the audience tunes into the Super Bowl to see the commercials instead of the game itself, right? So- yeah. As consumers, we, we don't mind being advertised to. What we don't like is when people are trying to like pull one over on us. And, right. you know, I think of like for myself, when I when I go to a drugstore and I walk down the aisles and I see these like giant, you know, like drugstore cosmetic companies featuring A-list, you know, celebrities. It's like, do I really believe that Nicole Kidman is using like drugstore makeup on the red carpet at the Oscars? Like, I don't really believe it, right? And so I think that that gap is what, causes influencer marketing to not be effective. So sure. from a B2B perspective, don't think about how many followers the person has. Don't think of if they're a big name. Don't think about, oh, this person has taken this many companies public or this person has credibility or they've been featured in these publications. Think of really if there are people who are trusted in the communities that you're trying to influence. So whenever product you sell, you, you presumably have like a core audience that you're targeting an ICP, so to speak. But think of who that ICP trusts and respects and really start your search there. Yeah. 
And something I've learned over the years too is that high follower typically equals low knowledge, whereas low follower, you're going to get high knowledge. And so if you're selling to, you know, if it's a DevOps crowd, a high profile technology influencer, a lot of followers, but depth of knowledge of DevOps low, whereas yeah. a author, right, who has written about DevOps has a low following, but the knowledge level is high. And it's me much more authentic and engaging experience for, albeit lower amount of followers, it's going to have a much higher impact. I think it's about how people internalize endorsement as well, right? And just how we learn as, as B2B professionals. So like, you know, there are so many books written by the CMOs of like giant companies like Google, Apple, Yahoo, et cetera. But like, I'm not really learning anything there because I don't need to read a book by a CMO who has like a 400 person team, you know, for a company that has been public for 10 years. Like that's not actually helping me in my day to day. I really want to learn from people who are at the very next stage of growth from where I am because the insights and advice that they have is actionable for me today. So I think if you think about influencer marketing that way, sure, there are def there's definitely value to using big names, right? And that goes for both B2B and B2C. Certainly people who have a lot of eyeballs or a lot of credibility, like I will buy anything that Oprah sells me, right? Because she's earned that credibility with me over the course of my lifetime. But if I'm really looking for, you know, the next like marketing tool that I want to buy for my team, I'm not going to go to like, you know, the the 20 year, 10 year CMO to learn about what to use. I'm going to go to the person who's like one stage ahead of us in growth and rely on them for their. I was on the Grin website just looking for different research and data points. And one of the pages I landed on was around the the mediums and the channels that are most effective or, or most utilized as two different things for B2B brands. LinkedIn was number one and that I sort of went, well, I, when I think of LinkedIn, I absolutely don't ever think of it as an influencer platform. <laughs> uh, TikTok wasn't on the list. However, as I kept going down a rabbit hole, you had some case studies of TikTok, not as exclusively a TikTok campaign, but as part of an overall campaign. They perform really well for B2B brands. So talk to us about which channels make the most sense. Do you think it's a combo? Should one index higher over another? Uh, specifically for B2B, what does that breakdown look like? Yeah, so this is yet another way in which consumer behavior has really shifted in that the lines between work and leisure are so blurred, right? Especially for those of us who work from home or work hybrid. So, you know, you might've thought like back in the day, LinkedIn was the work social network where you would only go when you're trying to do work thing. Whereas TikTok is like the fun social network that you only go to when you're trying to have fun. But all of these lines are blurred. So really what we've seen through B2B is that in order to have an effective strategy, you really have to have a solid creator and channel mix across all the networks. YouTube is great for like long form content. So if you're like a B2B SaaS company and you really want to take a customer through the journey of what it's like, you know, to experience using the product every single day. Yeah, you need that 20 minute YouTube video to really give that full clarity. If you're looking to catch someone like in the middle of their day with just like a quick hint of knowledge, a statistic, a quick endorsement, information, that's where TikTok is really valuable. Because when you have five minutes between meetings, are you really going to like LinkedIn to scroll or are you going to go read some like long form blog post? No, you're probably going to go to TikTok and you can actually catch consumers there in the middle of their work. Day. Right. And I'm not going to get this right, but the one that I came across is there was a it was some AI some company that generates content through AI and they basically tapped like a research fellow at a university who was young, had TikTok. And so you have to really just, I guess, think outside of what you typically classify as your, your play life on TikTok, but also take inventory of like, hey, well, who am I actually following and paying attention to? Because chances are to your point, yes, to sort of have your throwaway fun, personal stuff that you follow, but then you also are going to follow by sort of like your discipline, your title and your industry set at work and it all works together. So it's looking at who are those creators that, again, maybe it's a small following, but that they do have influence amongst their little community that you can tap that makes sense. Because I do think B2B brands say there's no place for me on TikTok. I, I think that's a general feeling. Uh, and to that, you say you do, it sounds like, and you need to have a mix and needs to run across all these channels. Yeah. And I think, I mean, like this is that Dave Gerhardt, who's like, you know, one of a uh, marketer that I really look up to is the CMO of Drift has always said is that you're, even within B2B, you're marketing to people, right? And it's important to not lose sight of that. And so I would encourage anybody who thinks that there's no place for B2B on TikTok to think through what TikTok is great for. It's great for informal content, right? That's sort of spontaneous, feels very like spur of the moment. It's not known for being hugely edited or 
very polished and not like the benefit of TikTok. And think of how much you've been able to learn from your peers or get recommendations or discover something new at like a happy hour, right? Like I think of so many times where I've been in a happy hour with other marketers and they've been like, oh, have you tried this tool? Or, oh, have you heard of this? And that like very informal, quick, authentic sort of engagement with, with one other person has led, led me and propelled me towards a buying decision. So there's no reason why you can't do the same on TikTok. What does not work is when you try and repurpose the same content across different networks, right? Like you can't take a, a studio shot commercial and try and make it go viral on TikTok. It just doesn't work. But there is a huge place for B2B brands to be successful, not just influencer marketing, but on TikTok specifically. And we've seen that through our, our customer base. I want to shift gears into sort of expectations around influencers. The most hated phrase with you right now, you being a SaaS marketer, is do more with less. Blech. It's the worst, right? Everyone's so tired of hearing it. But also, Ali, get the same results, or if not more, but just, you know, do, more, do yeah. that for, with less. Um, <laughs> when it comes to leveraging the creator economy, is there always money exchanged or is there a value exchange that, that you also see ad marketers are listening to this saying, I would love to do this, but got my budget, right? Um, is there always money exchanged? No, there's not. And that goes for, for B2B and B2C. There's a lot of different ways to, to make it work. Sometimes creators are just looking for ways to grow their profiles as well, grow their personal brand. And having the association with like a venture backed SaaS company gives them credibility if you can do other things in the creator economy, speaking engagements, other endorsements, et cetera. I've seen companies exchange equity or like shares in the company as a potential way of like getting someone's involvement long term. Of course, you want to make sure that that person is going to be a really good long term fit for you if that's the case. But certainly, if you find someone like that, Definitely worth giving them some skin in the game. I've seen companies do stuff where they've included uh, creators sort of in customer advisory capacities so that creators feel like they have a stake in helping shape the product. So in the same way that you might see like a public personality partner with a makeup brand, right? And that they launch a collection or a collaboration together. Similarly, if I was working with B2B influencers, if you could collaborate with them on an area that they're really strong at, not only can it help you in impact your product roadmap, but it gives them some ownership over the product as well. And and th there's a lot of different ways to do it without money, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, is one of those options to exchange for being on a webinar, having a speaking opportunity at their conference, uh, potentially you know, being quoted in a white paper? All, do all of those fall into that as well? Definitely. And like we, as marketers, we have so many tools at our disposal. We pretty often have the largest variable line item in any SaaS company, which we all deserve. But, you know, make sure we take advantage of being creative there because there's a lot of different ways that we can feature people in exchange for them helping us out as creators. Even beyond that, like, not only can you help them out, there's also additional things you can do to, like, build a relationship over time. So I've seen a lot of companies do almost more of an affiliate type of arrangement where you offer them a percentage of contract value in perpetuity. Um, or you offer them a certain amount of commission based on like deals that end up closing as a result sure. of their endorsement. So there's a lot of different ways to to skin that cat without necessarily blowing your whole budget. Yeah. The other uh, bit of research I came across in the Grin website when preparing for this conversation was why are you participating as a B2B brand in the creator economy or, or in influencer programs? And number one was to increase brand awareness. So that's the world I live in. Um, I run a PR agency for SaaS companies and we we play right up there, right? We're in the we're a top funnel awareness game. How are or how is, I guess, is the platform, or how do you see B2B brands measuring the effectiveness or value of these influencer relationships if if brand awareness is is really what they're looking for? I mean, are we reporting on shares, likes, comments, views? What does that look like? So this is the hard part about anything brand related as a, as a marketer, which anybody listening will for sure identify with. First, if you have like a, a CEO or an executive team that does not understand the impact of brand awareness, like you got to go somewhere else. That's just the hottest Run. truth because Run. life is too hard. Uh, life is too hard to work for like a, a CEO who just doesn't understand brand. But that being said, there are a lot of different ways you can show it. A, it should show up throughout every single other one of your channels. So you're not just thinking about like pipeline or revenue a direct impact. You're also thinking of influence. So I would venture to guess that anybody who's having this musing or this conversation with their team probably is actively engaged and trying to make sure that they are doing well on G2 or Capterra, right? You can't prove the value of those channels either. 
but you have this intrinsic belief that before people buy software, they're going to go to G2, they're going to go to Captera, and they're going to look. And sure, you can all those vendors have some direct lead flow, but that's not where the majority of your leads are coming from. They're not filling out forms on third-party websites to request demos. For you. What they're really doing is they're using that as like a social proof or validation. And so what I would posit to anybody listening is like, if you're willing to offer things like G2 and Captera, that level of disbelief and, and assuming that they're doing their job and that the influence and your close rates are increasing, your conversion rates are increasing as a result of that credibility, you should really be giving that same thing to creators. Ali, you know what would make the world a better place for people like you and I and marketers just really around the globe is if every CEO and founder just intrinsically understood that you there's 25 to 30 percent of your marketing budget that you cannot directly attribute to revenue it has no direct roi but we all know and agree that if you cut that everything else suffers and if i've <laughs> just accepted that fact and cuddled up with it at night our our lives would be a lot easier but that is not the reality unfortunately and we have a lot of listeners that are like, Lindsay, fuck, I know, but I can't. And my CEO doesn't get it. And I'm having to show the value. <laughs> but so, if we could just remove that, it'd be so great. So for those people, if you're in this like fucking dire situation where you work for a CEO who doesn't get marketing, <laughs> what I would recommend, start small and start with a really like narrow segment. And you have to buy yourself three months, give yourself a quarter of running creator campaigns in a very narrow segment, maybe it's not your your main ICP. Maybe it's like a side vertical or something like that that has like a little bit of a narrower impact on your on your pipeline and on your overall funnel. And then look at how every single part of your funnel will increase. More people will respond to your BDRs. More people will actually show up to your demos. More people will go from that demo to from the first call to the second call. More people will buy and they will buy at a, at a higher average contract value. And so really keep those snapshots over the course of the three months. And by the end, you should be able to showcase some data to your CEO of like, look, the world did not rapidly change in these three months. The only change we've made in marketing is that we're using creators to help drive awareness within this specific vertical. And you can see the impact that it's had on every part of the funnel. And then hopefully you will have a great like strategic finance person like I do who can help you put this together in a beautiful spreadsheet to really like quantify it dollar for dollar. Absolutely. I'd like you to talk us through like a step-by-step -step process. We, we've talked about sort of different parts and, and different components of, I'm, I'm clear on the step one, what's your goal? Why are you doing this? I mean, that, right? That's number one. What, what are your, what are you hoping to achieve with the outcome here? Then finding the influencers. Tell me what happens next. What does that like outreach look like? What are we asking for in that first touch point with identified influencers? Yeah. So I would say goes back to the goal. What I would say, you know, you hit on this, but to be really clear about it is have a very specific goal in mind. Don't just be like, oh, I want to increase top of funnel awareness. Like that's not a goal, right? What you want to say is like, I really want to make sure that these people have this impact. So I want to, I want to make sure that VPs in this space have more understanding that my product does X better than X. Make it really specific. And you can have a hundred of them, right? You don't have to get to all of them right away. But make your goals fairly specific and stay away from generalizing so you won't really be able to measure impact. Once you have that goal in mind, find the creators that you think are going to help you accomplish that. And it's different for whatever the goal may be. Sure. Once you've identified who the people are, now it's about figuring out like what's in it for them. So right. in the way that you teach your sales teams to like offer that messaging to prospects, think of it the same way with influencers. And luckily, you probably already have experts in your building right now who are really good at crafting that type of messaging leverage their expertise and yeah, figure out a way to reach out that shares a, why you think they'd be a good fit. Like what about them and their audience make them a good fit to work with you share what the partnership would look like. There's nothing worse as we could both probably attest to this, that when someone reaches out with like a vague ask and you don't really know what the time commitment is or what it's going to require of you or what you're going to have to do. So I would say get very specific about like, Hey, I'm looking to partner with you. We would love to run like a LinkedIn campaign together. We can collaborate on the content. We can collaborate on the subject matter and it would basically encompass about six hours of time over the course of three months for you. Like, is this something that you'd be open to? Here's where I think our audience is aligned. Here's where we can open you up to additional audiences that maybe you don't have access to right now. And here's where we would benefit from your involvement. And if you're okay. able to like put all that succinctly together, I think if it's, if it's the, the beauty of influencer marketing is if the person actually was right for you, they're likely to respond. Sure. 
All right. So outreach goes out. You say, yes, cool. We're aligned. Good job. Let's work together. There was something about a camp. I think I saw the word campaign brief. What is that? So campaign brief is the like holy grail document that lays out exactly what's expected of the creator within a given. Okay. Time. So what networks, what time frame, what the approval process looks like, you know, with uh, with some creators, let's say you've been working for them, I, I with, for working with them for two years. There are customers of ours who don't even review their creator's content before it goes live anymore. Right. Because they're like, they get us. We've been working together for so long. They have quicker turnarounds. For maybe a brand new relationship, you want to bake in a little bit of time for edit or for back and forth or for collaboration. So the campaign brief lays all of that out with timelines, milestones. It's very much like the, the project brief that you would get from agency if you were working with them yep. on a project. And it lays out all the terms. And is this something that you each sign to hold each other accountable? I'm not using the word contract. I mean, doesn't, unless there's being, you know, money exchange, I would imagine it's not necessarily a contract, but this is essentially what's going to find, yes, you're agreeing to do this and we're agreeing to do this. It certainly can be a contract. Like we have a DocuSign integration for that sure. exact purpose. Often is a contract. But yes, it's something that both parties are agreeing to. And often you'll go back and forth, right? Just like with any any other agreement, you might go back and forth and be like, oh, I don't think I can do this over the course of two months. I'm going to need 90 days. Or, oh, like, I would rather post this as an Instagram story as opposed to something on my grid. And so there is always that back and forth, but hopefully you get to like a good outcome that both parties sure. agree on. Okay. All right. So campaign runs. And then me as the brand, I have someone internally that has to be responsible for holding creators accountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is monitoring the campaign performance. And then when, let's assume that this is a sort of has, has beginning and an end. What's a creator responsible for in terms of reporting, if anything? So it depends on what you're using. So if you use a platform like Grin, it makes it really easy uh, because creators just have to authenticate and then brands are able to see all of the, the results that they need to see without the creators doing the work manually. If you're just getting started, often creators will have to like screenshot the metric, the performance metrics of the post or the content okay. to share with you so you can do reporting that way. So yeah, and I would bake that into the campaign brief as well. That like, hey, we're going to go live on this date and then 72 hours later or you know, whatever the time frame that makes sense for the campaign that you're running, please send me a screenshot of these metrics so that I can evaluate it for future posts. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm just going back through my notes here, my questions. I asked everything that I wanted to ask. Ali, is there anything that we didn't tackle that you wanted to make sure that we cover? I just think when this, like using creators and B2B is a space where as marketers, you can involve so many other stakeholders in the company to get buy-in on doing this. And if you think about something like an affiliate marketing program, right? For If you think about that from the consumer space, when you you know, see an influencer advertise a product. They say use code Lindsay10 for 10% off. And then you use that code, you buy the product, life goes on. I feel like it's really underutilized in B2B, but we're seeing a huge spike in people using affiliate marketing within the B2B space through our platform and then certainly generally as well. And what makes that great is like every CRO has had the issue of not knowing how much their team is going to have to discount, not knowing how many concessions they're going to have to make. Wouldn't it be great to know from the very beginning that like, okay, were you working with this creator? They're going to offer their audience 10% off, you know, an average contract value or offer them, you know, free professional services or whatever the concession is that you want to make. And then you know what you're getting, right? And everybody who comes in and avoids the back and forth that typically will increase the time to close and the velocity of the deal because there is not that awkward negotiation period. So I would say definitely get your, your sales and revenue leaders involved as well because this can have huge impacts on their ability to close deals quicker and in higher ACV and with less discounting. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, Ali, as I end every episode, I ask my guests if they have a favorite or signature toast to send us out. Oh, okay. Let me think. I have a couple, but I will do one that I feel like is the most timely, especially as we're coming out of COVID. And it is, uh, here's to staying positive, but testing negative. Love it. I will drink to that. Cheers. Thanks to Ali for joining me today on SaaS Half Full. I loved that conversation. Obviously, as you all know, talking about brand is near and dear to my heart. And we share the same philosophy that we should stop freaking trying to measure brand. For those of you that have listened all the way to the end of the episode, thank you so much. We have a end of the episode segment we like to call One More Drink, where I ask all of our guests the same question. Here's the question and answer from Ali. What do you wish more CEOs understood about marketing? I wish more CEOs understood with marketing that 
what's actually going to get you to the next level of growth that you're promising your board and you're promising like your advisors is investing in brand awareness. Like not all marketing yields leads and yields direct attribution pipeline. And really like companies spend so much time, money, manpower, money on consultants and like fancy agencies and analysts to come in and advise them on how to go to get to that next level of growth when they hit a stall. That like special sauce is really like the missing link that allows all of us as consumers to make behavior. When you think about like the, the, your favorite products or the brands that you love, that you really rep for, the logos that you feel comfortable wearing out in public, the, the products that you share with anyone, you know, friends, family, whatever. The reason why those brands have you in their clutches is because they have done the brand awareness work to get you to that place where you're an evangelist and an advocate, not just a customer. And if you're not letting your head of marketing invest in the non-provable channels to enable that, that's what's preventing you from hitting the next phase. Thanks again to Ali for joining me on SaaS Half Full. Absolutely love that conversation. Really appreciate the listen. If you like this show or love this show, please feel free to give us a five-star rating or leave a comment. Until next time, bottoms up.